Thank you, Kevin. That was beautiful. Sorry, I got a little interesting how when you don't end up um, having that transition from one building to another and the things I was used to doing. Sometimes I get carried away and forget. So I was having to get the Zoom started. All righty. As we begin this worship service, may we remember that the light that comes from our Christ candle comes from God, warming our hearts and brightening our way. If you will turn to your bulletins and please stand as we join together in our call to worship. We come this day hoping to encounter Christ. May we open our hearts to him. Amen. Our opening hymn today is hymn number 383. This is a day of new beginnings. May not be one you're really familiar with, but it is beautiful words and very appropriate to our time together today. Verses one, four, and five. This is a day of new beginnings. Time to be what I want. To show what love can do. This is something of new things. Verse 5. In faith we'll gather round the table to taste and share what love can do. This is a day of new beginnings. If you will turn back to your bulletins to our opening prayer, let us pray together. Gracious and glorious Lord, we come, as did Nicodemus, with questions on our hearts and in our lives. We come hoping someone can help us find answers and healing, but we are also hardened with doubts about self, others, and even you. Grant us healing and openness to your spirit that we may be better servants of your word, your will, and your way. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. <laughs> Thank 
You may be seated. Please join me in your prayer for illumination. God of all wisdom and glory, grace us today with the presence of your spirit, that we might hear today's word with understanding and imagination. This we pray in your holy and good name. Amen. Our Old Testament reading is Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 through 4, on page 10 of your pew Bible. Now the Lord said to Abram, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. I will make of you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great, so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and the ones who curses you I will curse. And in you all families of the earth shall be blessed. So Abram went as the Lord had told him, and Lot with, went with him. Abram was 75 years old when he departed from Haran. Uh, second reading is the epistle reading, uh, Romans chapter 4, verses 1 through 5 and 13 through 17 on page 154 of your pew Bible. What then are we to say was gained by Abraham, our ancestor according to the flesh? For if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. But what does scripture say? Abraham believed God and was reckoned to him as righteousness. Now to one who works, wages are not reckoned as a gift, but as something due. But to one who without works trusts him who justifies the ungodly, such faith is reckoned as righteousness. For the promise that he would inherit the world did not come to Abraham or to his descendants through law, but through righteousness of faith. If it is the adherents of the law who are to be the heirs, faith is null and the promise is void. For the law brings wrath, but where there is no law, neither is there violation. For this reason it depends on faith, in order that the promise may rest on grace and be guaranteed to all his descendants, not only to the adherents of the law, but also to those who share the faith of Abraham, for he is the father of all of us, as it is written, I have made you the father of many nations. In the presence of the God in whom he believes, who gives life to the dead and calls into existence the things that do not exist. May God bless all who hear these readings. All right, it is our time and our service for, is that yours? Yes. <laughs> a time in our service where we lift up birthdays and other celebrations. Any birthdays this week? Yes. All right, very nice. Yeah. children here today, as I said, Lindsay and family ended up going out of town. I do want to share with you, first of all, I love giving boxes. 
they're always present, even if it was a box of somewhere or something at work. It's getting kind of weird, but that's okay. Um, this week, when I went to the post office, one of those little notes in the box that was here, and it stopped, and it was this big old box. Yes, I'd like to go to the park, so it's for both our race park and Addison family. There is a church in Henrico Septum of Richmond who had read of the fire and things at Rose Park, and they have a stitching ministry. They make things. And they, one of their ministries, instead of the prayer shawls that are big and for you know, individuals, they make prayer, prayer squares. That's hardly the same. You have to put it off to be. And there's a little you know, scripture words of hope there as well. But they made these forts and sent them to us. They also made, and it was, I knew of this that they called it and asked me about numbers. When I opened the package, it was one of those that just makes you kind of have Because they're, and I haven't even looked yet to see it, but they had also made an altar cloth, a communion altar cloth for a car. And the most, and again, God's amazing, those amazing mysteries that fits their altar table perfectly. I didn't know it was coming. They didn't contact me or anyone else to say what body was your altar table. But oh my goodness, mm -hmm. it's beautiful. So when we leave today, I will have this back up here with me. Don't want to forget. And you can you can pick your favorite part. All right. I have put Marcus to a lot of work today. <laughs> Lindsay was going to help with this next part, but she was not able to come. So we, instead of me reading the gospel lesson in a more traditional format, you can have the word, we'll still have the words up there. We are going to do it as a skit with Nicodemus talking to Jesus. So you, you are ready? Let me, I'm going to give you a little background. And for those of you, and I know before I got here, some of you did a Bible study based upon the Chosen TV series. And this, it was interesting. When I was watching this ah, last winter, I believe, and this episode that talked about Nicodemus and showed Nicodemus in this setting was very powerful to me because we don't always take time to consider who Nicodemus was truly, other than the fact he was a Pharisee. In this story, we know that Nicodemus, he's a Pharisee. He's also a part of the Sanhedrin, a lawyer. And he is called to the Red Quarter. The Red Quarter was where women were sent at that time of the month, and I'll leave it at that. But there was this one poor woman who had been there for years. Terrible times. And she was in a lot of pain and she would moan and she would cry out. And those political leaders in the area didn't want to hear all that. And so they go and tap Nicola, Nicodemus and say, hey, you need to go take care of this woman. So Nicodemus, he was a little apprehensive, but he went and he gathered up the herbs and things that typically the priest would use to represent healing and to offer prayers to God for healing. My understanding is that he truly didn't believe in what he was doing, which is never a good way to get those things done. It's doing something like, okay, I'm doing it, but I don't think it's going to work. So he goes and he prays with this woman. He blesses her. He puts, you know, does the, the herbs and all those things. And he walks away shaking his head saying, this isn't going to help. A few days later, he's walking in the square, encounters this woman. She hadn't been out in years. And she is not moaning. She is not in pain. And he, he's amazed. But he's very smart. He knows that it was not him who caused this healing or who initiated this healing. And that's kind of where this story picks up where he, Nicodemus, was going to see Jesus. He would go at night seeking answers for some of his questions. Jesus, we know that you are a teacher and believe that you have come from God because all the signs you do show the presence of God. 
Truly, I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God without being born from above. But how can this be? We have already been born and are growing older. Are you saying that we have to climb back into our mother's womb to be born again? What is born of the flesh is flesh. What is born of the spirit is spirit. You cannot enter the kingdom of God without being born of water and spirit. Don't be astonished at what I have told you. You must experience a newness, just like a new birth. You look around, the wind blows where it chooses, and you hear a sound of it, but you do not know where it comes from or where it is going. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. I don't get it. I can't understand. Help me. You are a great teacher of Israel, and yet you do not understand anything about God. I have told you about earthly things, and you don't believe. How can you believe if I tell you about heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven except the one who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. And just as Moses lifted up a serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but have eternal life. God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but rather that the world might be saved through him. The word of God for the people of God. So I ask you, who is Nicodemus? Many of us aren't quite sure. We know that he was a Pharisee, and he belonged to this very strict religious sect of Judaism. And he took a pledge, as all the Pharisees did, to keep every detail of the scribal law. To a Pharisee, the law, the first five books of the Old Testament, was the sacred, perfect, and complete word of God, from which you could neither add nor subtract any word. Nicodemus, as I said, was also a ruler of the Jews and a member of the Sanhedrin, the Supreme Court of the Jews, which had 70 members. He was one of those. Their, <clears throat> their powers were limited under Roman rule, but still quite extensive. And in this position, they would spend days, hours, weeks, years reading and studying those first five books of the Old Testament. And so when they would hear something, they would immediately know if it sounded different than what they had studied, anything that might contradict their strictly conservative views. When you look up a history of Nicodemus, he is remembered as an outstanding Pharisee and a teacher of the law. He was also called an honest and upright man. He was kind of in a difficult situation because he felt God speaking to him, heard him, calling him to pay attention to the signs of the new way, the signs from this new teacher, this Jesus. But at the same time, he was wrestling with, how do I do this? He has his place where he's, he would stay in his role as a high priest, which was a position of status, a position of wealth. It had taken him years to get to that level. While he's considering that, he's also wrestling with this idea of how do I accept the radical teachings of this Jesus that were touching his heart? For accepting them meant leaving everything behind letting go of that position of power, that position of prominence. He was standing on quite the proverbial fence. How do I decide? Do I let all these things go and follow this man who seems to be the son of God? Or do I stay over here and just let that happen? He continued to wrestle with this for the remainder of Jesus' ministry. At Jesus' crucifixion, Nicodemus gave Joseph of Arimathea a hundred pounds of myrrh 
and aloes for Jesus' burial. That was a great cost, a great expense that he chose to give. And it was a challenge. It was dangerous because if his fellow Pharisees were aware of this, he would have been at least reprimanded for such a thing. According to tradition, sometime later, Nicodemus became a professed disciple of Jesus. It was after the resurrection, and he was baptized by Peter and John. And again, it came at a great price. He was stripped of his office. He was beaten. He was driven out of Jerusalem, his home. He was sheltered in a family member's house in the country until his death. He died in the eyes of the Jewish people, a disgrace. Eventually, years and years later, he was given an honorable burial near the body of St. Stephen. In the end, Nicodemus made a difficult choice, but the right choice and followed Jesus. Took him a little while. Sometimes it takes us a while too. When we consider who is Nicodemus, we see this man with great questions. He sees what Jesus is doing. He sees with his eyes. He has not quite believed in his heart. But he sees those signs of Jesus' divinity. He had seen the miracles. The woman who was suddenly healed, not at his own hands, but of those of Jesus. And as he worked to compare what he knew from the Old Testament and what had been promised through the Messiah, he looked, he planned, he worked for a way to see Jesus. Initially, yes, that was at night. He would sneak out and go talk with him, as some other leaders did. But he did come honestly seeking his God. By the time of Jesus' crucifixion, Nicodemus had grown bold enough to public reveal, publicly reveal what he believed. And this change that came about through Nicodemus was not by his own power. As he turned his life and wrestled and asked God for wisdom, for understanding, the Holy Spirit is how we gain that wisdom the power of the Blessed Spirit. During that time, he would read the Bible. He would read those scriptures. He would read the prophecies to grow closer to God, to gain understanding as we would do, as we do, as we immerse ourselves into the word. There are great benefits. There is good news. There is duty that comes from reading the Bible. Here is the gospel, good news indeed. God shows his love in giving his son for the world. God so loved the world, unconditionally loved the world, that he gave his son. Behold and wonder must fill our hearts when we consider that the great God the one who made us all should love us and love this worthless, messy, broken world that we had created through our actions, our lack of actions. God made the world. It was perfect. But we had messed it up. What is our gospel duty? Our gospel duty is to believe in Jesus Christ. God gives Jesus to us to be our prophet, our priest, our king, our conduit, our pathway to God. So that we can talk to God. But to accept Christ means that we must give up ourselves. We give up our ruling of ourselves. We give up our former be so that we may be saved by Jesus. 
Okay, that's our duty. What's the benefit of that? Why should we do that? That part should be pretty easy. That whosoever believes in Christ shall not perish, but shall have everlasting life. God, through Christ, reconciling the world to himself, and so saving it. The world could not be saved through us, but through him. There is no salvation in any other. From all this is shown the happiness of true believers. He that believeth in Christ is not condemned. John 3, 16. You can say it with me if you want. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whosoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Throughout Epiphany, the season of Epiphany, we talked about darkness and light. John continues to talk about the darkness and light. And he believes that sinful works are the work of darkness. Whereas those who accept Christ and seek the light act truly and sincerely in all they do. They desire to know the will of God. What is the will of God in your life? Nicodemus was looking. What do you want me to do, God? You're showing me this. You've taught me this. What do I do? And most importantly, past that desire to know is to accept, to take action, to do it. Though it may work, likely work, against your own worldly or earthly interest. Nicodemus was stripped of his title, beaten, sent away. Yet he chose. But it's not a change, again, that we can do on our own. But through this change, in allowing the Holy Spirit to work within him, his whole character and all his conduct is changing, a beautiful change, a transformation. The love of God fills our hearts, and through the Holy Spirit, God's love becomes the root of all our actions. As we consider these Sundays of Lent, as we prepare, it is a time to consider the love, the love that starts, ends with God. In 1 John chapter 4, verses 6 through 8, before I read it, I will say, I sometimes complain when I read John because he likes to use what I call circular reasoning, circular logic. His sentences seem to go in a circle. And back in those days where I had to grade English essays, we took off points for that. You got to just say it. But this is one of those times, This verse, these verses in 1 John, I'm okay with it because it's so perfect. We are from God. Whoever knows God listens to us. Whoever is not from God does not listen to us. That is how we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of deception. My first favorite part coming up. Beloved, let us love one another because love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whosoever does not love does not know God because God is love. God is love. Let us pray. Lord, like Nicodemus, we come to you in hidden ways. We have lots of questions, lots of concerns. And we aren't even sure that you really listen to us or that you were worried that you will think our questions are foolish. This new life that your son proclaims, it sounds wonderful. We have made messes in this life. 
some of which we have cleaned up, others that we have swept under the rug, hidden away in the closet, hidden from ourselves, and we believe that we've hidden even from you. But you know us better than we want to be known. You know our thoughts and our actions. Help us, Lord. How can we think, turn things around so that there is peace and hope? We offer to you concerns for family, community, and nation. And yet, we really don't want to have to give up anything. And we don't even always expect that anything will change. Nicodemus did not believe he could heal. But he saw when Jesus healed. Too often we are unwilling to change ourselves, and so change for the world appears as a wispy dream. Bring your presence powerfully to us. Convince us of the hope that rests in you alone. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We are here today to celebrate Holy Communion. We are going to begin, and I've changed up the service just a little bit as we are in this period of trends. So my invitation, we will begin on page eight. The invitation is actually on page seven, but the one that I'm going to share with you is slightly different. It's focused on our message today. So just be ready on page eight for our confession. Like Nicodemus, Christ invites us to the table. The table belongs to Christ and it is his to offer. We are not certain of how these things can be, but Christ assures us that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. Our table is open to all who are willing to open themselves and accept the teachings of Christ and call him Lord and Savior. Our journey is long. And we need the nourishment that comes through Christ as we step forward to receive Jesus. Let us profess our confession together. Merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We have broken your law. We have rebelled against your love. We have not loved our neighbors. And we have not heard the cry of the needy. Forgive us, we pray. Free us for joyful obedience through Jesus Christ, our Lord. And then if you will turn back to the screen. Friends, hear the good news. Christ nailed to the cross attests the cost of God's love and forgiveness. Friends. Believe the good news. And Christ, we are forgiven. Amen. At this time, if we will, I, I haven't run this by anybody yet. When we were at Mount Zion last week, they did the traditional passing of the peace, and it was very welcoming. If you all are comfortable with that, if you want to get up and wish someone the peace of Christ, please do so if you'd rather sit and just wave to others. I understand that as well. Kevin, if you will give us about just a, I'll look at you. If you will start playing something just to get our attention that it's time to come back. Just whatever. Just, just play until we come back. No, don't play until I tell you to. That's how you to come back. Oh. I did that. I liked that. Instead of saying, oh, yeah, you got to get back together. All right. So just let us
Thank you. That worked well. All right. At this time, we are going to sing, and you are going to stand. Come, sinners, to the gospel feast. We're going to sing verses 1, 4, and 5. Verse four. Five. Amen. Please be seated. All right. At this time, we are here. The most important thing that we will do here today together is to lift up others in need of prayer. We have those whose names are on our list from both congregations. Other names that we need to lift up today. I will lift up. I'm not going to talk a lot about it quite yet. It's very new. Um, my father passed during the night and we will be having a service for him later. But I truly believe I was raised by him and my mom. And you do. You continue. Life goes forward. And I know he is with his Lord and Savior and he's with my mom. So I'm here today doing as he would expect me to do. If there are no other prayer requests, let us go to our Lord in prayer. Gracious and heavenly Lord, we come to you. We have names on our hearts of those who need your loving care. Be with all those on our prayer list. Be with those who around the world are suffering. Those who live in darkness. Families who have lost loved ones. All need you. All of us question whether you really listen, that in our hearts, we know that you are there. You promise that you are always with us. Be with us now and forever. Amen. At this time, I would like to invite our ushers up so that we may collect our morning offering so that we can do and continue the work of God in this community. Amen.
Chief and Heavenly Lord, we give you these offerings so that others may find their way as you work through us to bring the world to Christ. Thank you for your many blessings, and may we continue to work with joy. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. We are going to be using the order for Holy Communion found on page, the Great Thanksgiving beginning on page nine. So if you will turn there with me. The Lord be with you. Amen. Lift up your hearts. Amen. Let us give our thanks to the Lord our God. Amen. It is right and a good and joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. You formed us in your image. You breathed into us the breath of life. When we turned away and our love failed, your love remained steadfast. You delivered us from captivity, made covenant with us to be our sovereign God and spoke to us through your prophets. And so with all the people on earth and the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you and blessed is your son, Jesus Christ. Your spirit anointed him to preach the good news to, to the poor, to proclaim the release of the captives, recovering of sight to the blind, and to set at liberty all those who are oppressed, and to make the announcement that the time has come when you would save your people. He fed the sick, or healed the sick, fed the hungry, and ate with the sinners. By his baptism of suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your holy church, delivering us from the slavery of sin and death as you made a new covenant with us through spirit and water. When Jesus ascended to be with you, he promised to be with us always and everywhere through the power of your word and your spirit. On the night when she gave himself up for us, he took the bread, broke the bread, gave thanks to you, gave it to his disciples and said, take, eat, this is my body. Do this in remembrance of me. When the supper was over, he took the cup, gave thanks to you, gave it to his disciples and said, drink from this, all of you. This is the blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sin. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these, your mighty acts, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ is died. Christ is risen. 
Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on those of us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine, that they may be for us the body and blood of Christ, so that we may be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. By your spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your son, Jesus Christ, and your Holy Spirit in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, almighty Father now and forever. Amen. Amen. And now with the confidence of the children of God, may we say the prayer that your son taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For that is the kingdom and the power and the glory. Amen. Because there is one love, we become one people. Because there is one cup and we share, we are part of that body of Christ, always and forever. The feast has been prepared. We are invited, not because of what we do. We are invited by the grace of God. Only through that grace are we worthy to come forward. But we are all invited who call upon Jesus as our Savior. Please come.
As we bask in the glow of the celebration, may we pray. Eternal God, we give you thanks for this holy mystery in which you have given yourself to us. Grant that we may go into the world in the strength of your spirit to give ourselves for others. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, amen. Our closing hymn today is one that, again, you may not be overly familiar with. The Lenten hymns are very different in tone and how they relate to us, but they are so important and so beautiful, and the words are so valid. So please, I'm going to ask that you remain seated for this one. And we're going to sing just softly. Let the words fill your spirit. First one. Three. Verse five. Gracious God, may we embody the love, the sacrifice that you taught us through your time with us. Be with us as we go forth to make disciples of all the world. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, may you journey in peace. Amen. Thank you.
Thank you. 